thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Ari. Um, I am the co-founder of Payload. Um, I'm sure everyone knows us, but just in case you don't, um, we're a media company. We cover the uh, business and policy of space. We're read by uh, 17,000 people a day. We're almost at 18,000. Um, and then we also do podcasts, webinars, events. Um, my, uh, my shameless shout out for the day is uh, if you're interested in advertising, um, let me know. You know, I, I always got to throw in an advertising um, um, pitch as, as everyone here who knows me. Um, but uh, on our panel, we have uh, Ian Goodridge and Evan, and I'm going to screw up his last name, Star Cynic. I think I actually did it right. And um, we're it. Gonna, yes, yes. And we're going to talk about um, BD and marketing in the federal government. Um, I'm thrilled to talk about it. It might not sound like I am. But I love love always talking about my federal marketing and BD, and um, we're going to make it exciting. I promise you that. Um, so I'll turn it over to Ian, and he can share uh, more about his background and what he does at Spire. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Eric. Thanks for the uh, chance to talk today, and hello, everybody. I'm looking forward to uh, kind of talking through some things with everyone. Um, my name is Ian Goodridge, as mentioned. I joined Spire uh, in late, well, early 2018 uh, as their first marketer. Uh, so I've had the fun of being the person that looks like you've got five heads when you walk into a room full of engineers and scientists and you say, hey, look, we're going to turn this into a uh, revenue generating company. Um, I launched the uh, commercial product lines for Spire, which includes the maritime aviation and weather uh, um, product lines. And then about two years ago, two and a bit years ago, I moved into the government team 100%. Uh, and since then, I've been focusing uh, a lot more attention on the radio frequency intelligence product suite. So, thanks, Harry. Looking forward to it. Awesome. And Evan, on to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Evan Starcenic. I'm the Spire's U.S. Federal Team's Marketing Manager. Um, I've been working for the company for about eight months now. Prior to that, I was a surface warfare officer in the Navy, uh, ran some surface weapon systems testing, spent a couple of years in an engineering plant, and uh, finished out for about two and a half years working SATCOM and some other stuff out of a radio shack, all on the LCS platform, USS Detroit, specifically out of Mayport. Um, nothing in my background was necessarily marketing, but I do love talking to people and happened to find Spire at a lucky transition point in my life and kind of fell in love with everything they do. So it's been a blast being in this space so far. Great to hear. And, and Ian or Evan, maybe before we start, just give like the quick 30 second pitch on like just what Spire is for folks who like aren't familiar with it. Um, so I don't know, Ian or Evan, do you want to do that? Keep, keep, keep going, Evan. Yeah, so Cube Satellite Powered Radio Frequency and Data Analytics Company. Other than launch, we're completely vertically integrated. So the design, manufacturing, ownership, operation of all of our satellites, which number about 120 in low Earth orbit right now, is all done in-house. We also own our own network of ground stations, about 34 uh, placed strategically around the world and 70 antennas to help with the management of our constellation as well as the data downlink. We collect and sell maritime aviation, earth intelligence, and weather data. So maritime in the form of AIS messages, a, um, aviation in the form of ADSB, which are both in the VHF part of the spectrum, and then GNSS reflectometry and radio occultation for earth intelligence and weather, respectively. Uh, a couple of years back, we moved into what we call space as a service. Uh, we have built and launched a lot of satellites, about 160 in the company's 11-year history. Found out we were very good at it and very good at doing it quickly. So expanded from the backbone of our constellation, which was the 3U model, up into 6, 12, and 16U models to offer a little more payload available volume for customers on our satellites. And we can get a satellite up in about 6 to 12 months, depending on the project right now. Awesome. Fantastic. And just so you guys know, this isn't a sponsored webinar. It's not all about Spire. The, the Spire folks are just lucky enough, uh, or plus, uh, let me rephrase that. I was lucky enough to get them onto the uh, onto the webinar to talk. So like, feel free, like if you guys have questions, like maybe you have a specific question about like something at your company or whatever, like ask it in the chat or you can ask it in the Q&A. I always find like these go well when people are like active and they have questions about what we're talking about and stuff. So that's, you know, something that I wanted to talk about. So I had, I had a few topics just to get things started. And again, you know, Jump in if if anyone in the chat wants to to chime in with thoughts or additional questions. But I wanted to talk about you know I think when we talk about marketing to the federal government, um, it's something that's super specific, right? You know sometimes 
you know, you're just trying to reach maybe a specific, you know, congressional person, or there's a specific person at a, an agency like a NOAA or an NRO that you really care about. And it's so much of quality over quantity. You know, Ian or Evan, can you guys talk about your approach to making sure that, you know, you're not necessarily going wide, but you're going like deep and, and there's quality. And sometimes I think also getting buy-in from management on that type of stuff, because I know a lot of, you know, management folks, they don't necessarily always understand marketing and how it works. They're so focused on raw numbers that it's like, hey, you reach 500 people, that's great. When it actually is more important to reach five people over and over and over. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Ian, and, and Evan, you can chime in. Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, I think there's quite a few markers that show that kind of activity is necessary. So, you know, we're, we operate pretty much a 50-50 split between commercial revenue and government revenue. Um, and, you know, um, that means that there's a, mount, a fair amount of inbound activity that comes to Spire through campaigns that are running and, and just general awareness. And I would say safely that the commercial teams probably get maybe 40 or 50 inbound kind of leads a week. Whereas Evan and I, are you, if we get one or two, we're like, huh, that's interesting, right? Because the government isn't reacting to, you know, the, the overall presence. The, the inbounds are going to be very specific, you know, like, hey, we've got an RFI, we missed you, can you respond to it and things like that. So right away, your numbers game, you have to be ready inside the company. Because when we go to our monthly marketing executive reviews, we flash up our numbers, everyone's like, you know, dude, you got like four M MQLs, like Maritime has 9,000, you know, like, what are you guys doing wrong? And then you very quickly have to get past that and get into the the you know the quality of the actual outreach and i think one of the reasons why you know we jumped on this webinar um was the fact that you mentioned bd and marketing working together and what one of the things what we've done at spire is the our marketing team is pretty much a bd team so we're take we're playing a lot of those longer games for for the development so we're nurturing those relationships with those with with the house the congress things you know the critical parts of the division we're we're, we're working with them over the years because the salespeople have to be more more tactical. They have to be focused in the quarter and things like that. So we're doing more of that long term, longer term BD. And so that would be my kind of um, opening response to that question. And then anything to add? Yeah, I think to add to that too, just kind of playing off the quality over quantity aspect of it. Um, a lot of the outreach we do is very specific. Uh, there's an aspect of it too that plays into brand perception. Um, and I, when I'm doing this outreach and talking to these individuals or trying to make contact, I make sure that what I'm sending them is very targeted. And I've done my homework ahead of time, ensuring that whatever I'm sending them is applicable. You know, there's always a time and a place for, you know, blasting out a ton of, um, just like generic company material, uh, talking about everything that we do. But a lot of what I try to focus on is making sure that it's really tailored material that's going to grab their attention in the first sentence or so. And it's not just going to be more junk mail that's going to get eventually filtered to their spam folder if I keep beating on their door with messages. So, yeah, one of the things that I wanted to sort of touch, go further on that is, you know, when we talk about, I, I look at BD as more of a, you know, game that can be measured in terms of interaction, I shouldn't say game, but an activity that can be measured in terms of interactions. Um, you know, a lot of people, it's like, hey, I made a sale or I didn't. When you talk about, you know, integrating marketing with that, it's more of a softer approach, right? Things like going to a conference and like, hey, like in, and I, I, I joke, Ian's dedication to Spires is greater than any other company Zoom where he has the, the satellite and the photo, but like things like that are great examples of like, how do you measure the value of that? And how do you help combine that? Because so many BD people we talk to, they're like, hey, I'm just, and they don't, they don't necessarily understand the power of like, oh, we need to make sure we have a good booth and the booth looks nice, but like you can't measure the value of that. So how do you bring those two things together to help create buy-in, you know, between those two units? So Evan, we'll start with you there. Yeah, I think it's unique in the federal space, uh, especially. And I think we're lucky enough to have a team uh, that is largely uh, ex-military and kind of understands the structure of a lot of these organizations. And then having, you know, gone into the sales side as well, uh, the cycle and how long these types of things take, but relationship building on the BD and marketing side is kind of my most critical thing. Um, because like you said, it is a softer play. It's a longer term play. And if you're building a relationship outside of just trying to sell this person something or cram the information, 
you know, into their head, it's going to keep you in their mind and thinking about our company, in this case, Spire and what we sell and how it could be applicable to future projects as well. Ian, anything to add there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, um, on the content side, there's a pyramid kind of like, you know, the classic B2B awareness interest uh, evaluation purchase. Maybe that's the, the steps that we're all looking at on commercial. But then the government one, I think it's definitely the education part is is the biggest chunk of that at the top. Um, and then the, and the next step after the education is trust. Um, and those are the two things that we focus on. So when we when we go to a show, um, and one, you know, and I'm, I actually really want to share some little, you know, things we do that might, you know, some people might pick up and be like, you know what, that's quite interesting. I, we should consider doing that. Um, events are a good one. Events are very expensive. You know, you have to be very selective from where you go. I mean, Spire, we're publicly traded, right? So I can say this. We just went over a hundred million in ARR, right? So that's not a massive company, right? But we want to go to as many shows as we can. And the ROI measurement of that is, is, is a nightmare. It's always been a nightmare. Anyone who thinks they can, the only way you can get ROI from a show is literally if you're running credit cards in the booth, I think, which we've not done yet. But, um, so one thing we do to help with that focus is we have Geo in next week, right? Which is a big show in St. Louis for the, um, USGIF. And that's actually Spy Federal's last show of the year, right? Which is kind of surprising that we're cutting off in May. So we front, we front load the fiscal year of, 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 you know, with shows that we can afford to go to. And then we, um, we cut it off and then we, we work with the team to work on that development from those, from those shows. And right there, I think, is a difference, a difference from kind of a normal year round event plan where we would just have to go back and focus on what's the next event? What's the next event? Literally, the next event is AGU in December, which is, you know, we, we haven't even thought about going there yet kind of thing. But that that break point there that between the end of this month and the end of the year is when we're going to work with the sales team and the BD team to get that ROI out of those shows uh, and things like that. Yeah, so let's let's touch on shows because you know that's the the uh, the big the big channel in and I think in the space industry, you know, when you're when you're looking at shows, especially from a federal government point of view, you know, how do you help? How do you measure? Um, hey, this is a good show. You know, should we just be attending? Should we be sponsoring? You know, what what should our booth look like? But then also, I think. You know, when I go to a lot of these shows, you know, a lot of the BD people are just at the booth, you know, also thinking about, hey, can like marketing and BD do stuff before the show, do after the show, what can they do? So I know that's a big loaded question, but but we'll start with we'll start with Evan on that and then turn it over to Ian. Yeah, leading up to the show, um, decision wise, I try to look at years past. And again, I'm very new to this space. So my sample size for experience is definitely smaller. But I make sure that I do my research ahead of time and understand who generally goes to these shows. And that's a big um, determining factor as to whether or not we attend or what our level of involvement is in that show. Um, with regards to working with our BD team, it's um, getting, you know, figuring out who's going to be there, reaching out and seeing if we can talk to these people beforehand and try and set something up. And whether that's a video meeting before with, uh, you know, future in-person meetings scheduled at the show, just to kind of build an initial relationship there if they're a newer customer or, you know, circling back with another customer that we had talked to previously or still might be in business with if we have something new going on. And, and I want to I jump in before Ian, like something that I always talk to people about that, like, and again, this is like, you know, it's almost against payload because I'm like, don't spend money with us and do this sometimes is like, you know, if you, if you, if you're getting emails at a show, like, a simple thing to do is just like create an email list and once a month, just email them with like updates, but don't, I think what a lot of companies will do is they'll like create an email list and then they'll do these dedicated sends of like, Hey, we're at this show, book a meeting. Like that's not adding value. Like just try to add, like, even if it's two minutes of value of like, Hey, here's an update about Spire that mm-hmm. like would probably matter to the customer. And then in that same email, hey, we're going to be at Geo this week, book a meeting with us or whatever, or this month. Yeah. Like, that's a yeah, super whether that's a product update people. or somebody we worked with, uh, you know, recent contract win or something like that. There's always e- even something small you can send and beyond like what you said, which is just a, hey, we're going to be there. Come talk to us. Yeah, exactly. So, Ian, over to you. Yeah, I think um, I think the, the reach out before is important. Um, and then there's little things as well, like during the actual show itself, like one of the rules we have is, you know, we always have a very well manned booth. And I, I'm, I'm absolutely not saying that, you know, you get people in the booth sometimes that have, 
no clue about the company. I mean, we've all seen that, right? But um, when you have a product, when you have a show that the audience is extremely technical and extremely knowledgeable, um, you don't, you, you obviously need to set up a schedule where people are meeting ahead of time or meeting during the uh, conference room. You know, if you can afford a, if you can afford a booth, uh, sorry, a meeting room, always get a meeting room if you can afford it. If they let you have a meeting room without a booth, get the meeting room, right? And really work that schedule. But we really try to have a minimum uh, amount of people on the booth that can actually ask, answer really challenging questions. Space Symposium for us this year was, uh, isn't that, that's not a cheap show. Don't get me wrong. Like we, you know, we sunk a significant amount of the marketing budget into that show. Um, but the amount of questions that came up that were DOD kind of attendees, other world government attendees, those questions were not like, tell me what Spire does. Those questions were like, on which frequency can you geolocate, um, you know, uh, items in my EZ? Like literally like straight into a use case and a problem. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to just be, well, let me tell you about Spire. You actually want to dig, dig run into that from the technical side as well. So uh, that would be the only, the only add-on. And then this is a shout out and obviously just, Again, uh, you know, I'm obviously going to talk about Evan because he's here, but um, we actually have quite a few uh, members of this team that are um, from the service academies like Evan, so the former Navy, former Air Force, former, um, you know, a Marine Corps. And um, we don't promote that as like a reason to, um, you know, come talk to us like, hey, we got these guys. But when someone from those departments comes up, there's a, there's a, there's a rapport, obviously, that you can't fix from, you know, someone like me who sounds like a foreigner, um, you know, um, but uh there's also an understanding of who that person is. Like, you, I can't tell you how valuable it is to have Evan say, hey, that guy is X or that lady is Y. And just knowing the level and knowing the, the you kind of entourage that's following you around, super, super helpful tip there as well. So everyone should just hire Evan, except he can't because he works for us. <laughs> so I want to go to the chat and Q&A with a question that's a bit relevant to this. So when you're targeting the federal government, you know, some people struggle to know, hey, what chat, like, who am I selling to, right? Like, because it's, it's such a large, you know, entity in so many ways. There's so many, you know, plate channels to go through, procurement, things like that. You know, how do you um, figure out which, you know, areas to uh, target and like, hey, we should start with DOD or NRO or whatever. How do you, how do you figure that out? That is a fantastic question. Um, and I, I want to break this down into a few things because not only are those top line, you know, executive branches, not only are they big, there are even, you know, like once you start blowing those up, like, like NOAA, NOAA is a good example. Navy is a good example. The amount of different departments in that. So I think I'm going to split that into two things. Um, if you're, if your company that you're representing is, is, um, uh, here on the call, if you are selling something that's already being bought, then I think the answer is pretty obvious, right? I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, a smart ass and say that, but, um, you know, the amount of tr coming from a commercial background, I did commercial software for, for 15 years before I moved into, into space. Um, the amount of transparency and awards and the amount of data that's, that's available to every single one of us. And you don't need to buy fancy subscriptions to get into that. I mean, there's the federal procurement systems. It's a really awful website from like 1990. Hopefully nobody on the call is responsible for that. Um, but like you literally can go through with minute detail, every bid, every award. You even know how many bidders there were on a certain project. So it literally is a bit of a, of a data crunch. But if you're selling something that's already, already being consumed and already being bought, you, there's no reason you can't go in there and figure out who's buying it and go from there. Um, then, but then that isn't a slam dunk, right? Because you've got the weirdness, which is a, an agency buying it on behalf of someone else. And then that's not, they're not even in connected. There's like a budget shift happening here. We had the same thing uh, in at the height of the pandemic. We were awarded um, a um, space, sorry, a um, um, regular occultation buy because we're, uh, you know, this is not a sales pitch, it's just explaining the use case. But as we all know, air travel shut down. So we weren't seeing any transatlantic flights coming into the US or out of the US. And as you, as a lot of you probably know, as those aircraft fly, they pick up atmospheric data on board those aircraft that gets sent down to the US for weather forecasting. And that data source has gone away. So they needed to add an extra data source to support it. So NASA ended up buying our data to give to NOAA. And like, that's a good example of how complicated that you have two very independent civil agencies there. But if you can, if you figure out if, you, if, you know, like I said, if it's being sold or bought, then away you go. The other side of that is we're doing something net new. If you're doing something, you're trying to break into the government and you're trying to get from, you know, we have a better X and we, sh you know, you should consider this. 
um, you really need to focus on, and the, the, the question's gone away, but like if, if there's a whole bunch of the Cibra things, the FWorks things, the innovation things, the front door and the space service side of things. The government does make that relatively hard to do, but not by choice. It's just more of a process. There's a lot of those agencies you can you can start plugging away and getting your information in there that are pretty easy lift um, for, for getting your awareness. Get some briefings going. Um, you know, that would be the other thing I'd add. I know I said two things, but the third thing, you know, it, it literally encourage your team and even do the briefings for your team. This is where the BD and the marketing side comes back. Like what better two people to put on a briefing with a bunch of army types that are just starting to look at RF for ISR, right? Like put Evan and I on there, you know, we'll run through the capabilities, we'll answer the top level questions, and then we can kind of get the right name from there. It's just the, there's three things working together would be my advice. Um, hopefully that helps that question. That's a great question. Whoever answered that, thank you. It was a great question. Yeah. Evan, anything to add? I mean, I can try. That was, I mean, that was a great job at covering all that. Um, the other thing I would kind of say too is if you want to get deeper into the weeds, um, and this is something that, you know, I'm just familiar with because of my time in the Navy, there are um, a lot of instructions that are written for the DOD and every sub branch are available publicly on the internet. I mean, there's higher classifications of certain ones, but a lot of like the main operating parameters of a lot of different sub commands within the different branches of the DOD are available offline. It talks about their mission set and uh, kind of what they're looking to do and how they're looking to do it. So if you know your product well enough and you're willing to put in a little bit of extra legwork on that front and do some admittedly very dry, plain legal worded reading, uh, it's a great way to learn about the structure of a lot of these different commands, who they report to and what their missions are as well. So, you know, we talked about, okay, we maybe we've identified the agency, we met them at a conference. You know, I, I sort of, I want to touch on maybe additional ways to stay in touch with those folks. So we can talk about like, you know, I know Ian loves social selling. Let's start with that of like, okay, we've made the contact, you maybe you've added them on LinkedIn, talk a bit about social selling, how that works, you know, how you found that successful inspire. Yeah, so this is, I mean, if people are going to take one thing away from this conference, I mean, of this, this call, maybe that'll be it. So Spire Federal as a team does not send any outbound email, we do not send, uh, we send transactional email, which is related to the products and things like that. But from a pure marketing point of view, um, we basically phase that out over the last year and a half. Occasionally we might do one or two quick things for a very, very minute audience when we've been given a list. Good example of that would be like the NASA CSDA program we're on, which is um, the commercial small sat data acquisition program. We get a list of all the researchers that are involved in that program. We're likely to email them, but all of our outreach is done through social selling. And, and what we've done in house is um, we've automated the sharing of LinkedIn profiles, which um, doesn't mean it's not like sharing a net Netflix password, right? It's actually like we've automated the ability for us to kind of help all the BD teams and sales teams send messages um, and cadences and things like that into, into LinkedIn. We spend a lot of time creating that content, um, making it very, very, uh, you know, appropriate. I'll give you a good example of one that has had crazy success. Well, I mean, three meetings is good success, right? Going back to the point we were saying earlier, you know, like, we're going to get these big briefings, we're going to work through, we're going to see who's talking about this within the agency and go from there. Um, we sent out a message to um, hundreds of people uh, just over the last few weeks. And the message literally was, we are collecting raw GNSS disruption data over Taiwan. Uh, is that of interest to you? Question mark. I mean, that is a pretty narrow thing to ask. And um, we get lots of like, you know, no, not, don't care. And then we get three people saying, yes, yes, yes. And those three things right there are now all active opportunities for us to, to, to move some of that data into the, into the government. And the kicker is some of that, some of that actual purchasing of that data will come from other agencies. So we actually won't even be able to directly sell to the people that are interested, but they can then go to another agency and buy it and collect it through that way. Uh, so that would be, um, that would be one, um, one, one comment on that. But email for us is pretty much dead. Um, I think everyone's familiar with deliverability issues. Um, everything gets stripped out. Everything gets turned into text. Um, it, it, it just isn't working. That's whoa, 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 whoa. Besides, b b besides payload, of course, guys, just it's important, <laughs> it, important it's to remember a, that <laughs> we, have, we have a, we have a 50% open rate, high click throughs. <laughs> I can, I can show the case study. So just. Just well, have to, just have okay, to say that. Here's your defense, defense for that, though, Ari. You're actually educating the market. You're not selling. That's a very big difference. That that kind of message yeah, will go um, through. So yeah. But yeah. but um I, before I turn it over to Evan, I want to make sure I see 
Joseph Sasso wrote in the chat. I feel like it's it's relevant. Um, do you find um, – yeah, well, actually, I want to make sure. Ian, do you understand the question? I, I might not totally be getting mm -hmm. it. Oh yeah, that's, yeah. That's um, that's a, that's actually going back to the RF question. Great, um, Ian, Ian will answer. <laughs> yeah, um, it it is our raw data is still very much top of mind, but we are we are starting to see um, you know, there's always this middle layer, right, of um, uh, of, of of providers, primes, integrators. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more interest with them with the with the process data, uh, but raw is still absolutely uh, top of mind right now. So, good question, though. Thanks, uh, Joseph. And Evan, anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I'll, the only thing I'll add to the uh, social selling explanation that Ian gave is that, you know, we are, it is a broad message that we're sending out. Um, and the human aspect of it is on, never going to change. I mean, you'll see that with email and cold calling and pretty much every marketing or sales technique used, right? It's somebody might not be at their computer when you send it and it'll just get pushed to the bottom. Somebody might not feel like picking up the phone. Um, but when we are sending these, you know, broad messages that kind of peak a little bit of interest because they're so big. We are again doing that legwork to make sure that the people that we are targeting is an aggressive word, but the people that we're picking to send these messages to, right, um, are at least associated in some way with the entity or, you know, adjacent laterally or vertically to an entity that would have a use for one of our products. So, you know, a follow up to that based on the QA. And also, again, as I will consistently say throughout this, uh, webinar. If you have questions, you know, comments, fun facts, you know, put it in the chat. If you're, if you want your question to be private, put it in the Q and A. Only, only Ian, Evan, and I can see it. So just want to throw that out there. But you know, one of the questions in the Q and A, and and I'm gonna actually change it a bit is, you know, if you meet someone at a conference and it's someone that's either too senior or too junior, or it's like the person you need to meet, the specific job title they're not going to those conferences, but their colleagues are going. How do you get that transition from, you know, I've met X, Y, Z, or I met X, I want to meet Y. How do you, how do you work on that? How do you, you know, is, is it, what tactics are successful inspire to help, to help facilitate that, that intro and interact inter introduction. So Ian, maybe you go first on this. Yeah. Uh, so that's a good question. And I think, um, you know, obviously, sometimes we do have good level people coming to the shows as well. And we can kind of play that card. You know, hey, our CTO will be and our chief innovation officer will be at the show, you know, really wants to meet uh, and things like that. Um, potentially sponsor um, some kind of event that gets that audience. You know, that's always an option, you know, a happy hour that's dedicated and then really have the uh, outreach teams try and get those people in there. Uh, but honestly, even if, you know, we meet a, you know, a, a you know, uh, um, I think the question is if the levels, the people you meet are too high and you kind of maybe want to come down to the people that are more likely to be using it and actually championing it. Um, you, you, I think you can use the social selling side of it as well. Like, you know, everyone you meet, collect it, get on, on LinkedIn. If they're active, that's, that's a way to get in there, right? Like literally if they're posting and commenting about their strategy, what their needs are, you know, show up as a comp, sum up as someone replying on that and say, Hey, you know, it's Ian from, from Spire. We met at Space Symposium. Really enjoyed our conversation about, um, about, you know, XYZ solution. Who was it that I should talk to at your company? And you're doing that in a public forum, right? Literally, you're, it's on a public LinkedIn post. They will reply to you. They will either DM you or they will reply right there with the person's, uh, uh, handle in LinkedIn handle. I sound like I'm on a CB radio. Sorry. Um, and, uh, username in, in LinkedIn. And, um, th from that, you've got what you want. So, um, that's one tip, one, one trick that has worked really, really well to, to kind of cut through that, uh, that issue. Uh, a little bit of a shame game later on, on the, uh, on the follow up. So. I have anything to, to add to that? Yeah. I think, you know, obviously having a pre-established connection and feeling comfortable or, you know, and at least in a place where you can ask that question, expect an answer is great. But in lieu of that, um, you know, searching through LinkedIn and finding kind of that network within that company, uh, especially in the different product verticals is pretty effective through things like um, sales navigator, right? Uh, and you can connect to these engineers and, you know, the types that you're trying to get excited about using the product. But just remember when you're doing that social selling, the outreach you're doing to somebody like an engineer who's going to be actually working with your product is going to be different than trying to just pique somebody's interest with a generic statement, right? So you have the interest at the top level at that point. So you need to drive interest from the bottom level. So what we like to do is tailor what we're sending those individuals um, to be more on the technical side and something that they can kind of sink their teeth into 
and play around with a bit and get excited about. Um, so it really is just kind of in my head and from my approach, at least it's tailored material specifically for the tech side and the end user that's going to make them excited about using what we have to offer. So, you know, Evan, I want to, I want to follow up with that. Um, you know, obviously we talked about facilitating intros, you know, externally in terms of meeting, you know, colleagues and companies, but I also want to talk internally about this and bringing you back to, you know, that integration of BD and marketing, you know, I'll go to a conference a bunch and I'll, um, get a call maybe a week later from like some random sales rep trying to sell me, you know, and, and, and no offense to like uh, Hewlett Packard, if anyone from this calls on HP, but like <laughs> HP enterprise, like products. Cause like I went to their booth with like no qualification, you know, or, or any of that. How do you make sure that like, you know, the teams are working together that like, Hey, we saw this lead. Oh, like someone already interacted with them. Or like, hey, this is a quality lead. Or like, like I'll just see so many people. They'll just like, hey, can I scan your badge? And then like, they're not like, oh, hey, my name is Ari. How are you? Oh, at the end, hey, let me. Like, it's just like, let me scan you. I'm like, okay, like, like, and again, and maybe it's so numbers game focused. That's also a problem. But, but yeah, I'll let, I'll let you. I'll let you chime in on that. Yeah. So I think you know the big part about that is you know you have to be comfortable. To- enough to understand that it's it can't be specifically a numbers game because it just really doesn't work as well in the territory that we operate in. Um, as far as coordination wise, uh, we have meetings post show with a lot of our reps. We also tend to bring out a pretty, if you've ever stopped by the Spire booth, we've got a pretty big team that we go out with to these things because a lot of these big government shows kind of a piece of everybody's territory is out there. And if it makes sense for them, uh, travel wise and workload wise, we like to have them out there as well to help establish those initial connections. Cause I think it's beneficial to us on the marketing and marketing side and also to the sales reps and business development uh, individuals as well. Um, sorry, kind of lost my train of thought there, but. In terms of, in, in terms of integrate, yeah. right, Ian, you want to jump in then? Then we'll bring it back to, to Evan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I think uh, I, I think the volume thing is important. I mean, like with, with that, we've all been there, right? Where they're just, it's all about just scanning your badge because they need to hit 500, 600, 1,000 scans or something like that at the show. Um, and as we've touched on already, that isn't, that doesn't, for us, isn't, hasn't been the focus. It might, it might need, you might need that. You might have a, a marketing leader that insists that, you know, you go to a show and you have to have that kind of volume. And then on the follow-up side of things, um, you know, um, one of the nice things about the, you know, the team, uh, you know, the team kind of want relying on us. So here's, here's how I explain this. Actually, this might make more sense. We're all familiar with stages in a CRM, right? For, for a deal opportunity. Usually it's like stage one or stage seven, right? Seven being closed one or awarded. And, and then you've got like all the way down from there. And each of you have probably got a CRM. You're all probably using it separately, differently. But at, the, at its crux, you're going to have a deal and it's going to move along those stages. Um, what we found is very effective and actually how it helps with that situation, the area we're talking about is we follow up, right? So let's say it's based symposium. We probably probably picked up 30 opportunities that we should be checking down. Evan and I are the two that we're going to go through the notes from the day, um, the people who met them, you know, it, t- talk to each of us and say, okay, what was the conversation about? Then we're going to do a little bit of research with our data team to say, okay, what kind of awards? Where is this person within the within the organization? There's a great website out there called GovSearch that uh, I think it's changed its name recently, but it, it used it's famous because it used to print out these PDF books of the entire U.S. government, and they were like, you know, you can imagine, right, like these giant encyclopedias of of, of org charts. They have an online version of that. You can quickly find this person. Uh, and then you can kind of find their agency to where they're around. Then you can go from there and do that work. And then we'll do those outreach. And then we will be the ones moving it from stage one to two. And two is there's an opportunity identified. There's there's funding in place. There's a path to revenue. Then we hand it over to the sales team. And I think having that early stage connection prevents that, hey, it's um, so-and-so from Hewlett Packard. You're ready to buy a new printer or whatever they're trying to sell you. Yeah. So someone asked a follow up question as it, I think, specifically, uh, you know, pertains to like LinkedIn follow up. And, and, um, I know we touched on like you gave an example of like the Taiwan, um, yeah, um, target yeah. post, but like, how do you like create effective targeted content? 
Um, you know, what tools are you using? And then a big buzzword I got to throw in for the day is like, are you using chat GPT, AI, <laughs> AI helping with any of this blockchain? No, I'm joking on the blockchain part, but, but maybe I'm not, I don't know, but, but AI, you know, maybe talk about if any of that can help with you guys. I think we, uh, we host blockchain on a satellite, right? So that's kind of funny. So, um, so, uh, yeah, so I think, um, uh, well, one, one thing I've seen that's been really effective is, um, uh, kind of the value of your content. And again, you know, this is a luxury that you have when you kind of have a, the support from your executives and things like that. But we, uh, one of the pieces of content that worked really, really well. Um, we haven't done this recently because we've been focusing on a few other things, but we were actually creating, um, we were, on contract with a intelligence as a service provider, which is a great sounding name for a company. And we would pay them, uh, you know, a chunk of money every month to, uh, and we would get to pick from what global events that were in our sweet spot, right? Like things we were actually interested in and we were pitching. So for example, um, there's a report that I'll be posting maybe after this or maybe tomorrow. And it talks about the Chinese military buildup recently in Taiwan, right? That's all very topical to what we were just talking about, right? So obviously the alignment is there. But this is a report. This is a detailed report of all the Chinese ships that came in and around Taiwan, where they're from, who was on board. You know, it's a it's an intel as a report. That report is worth seventy five hundred dollars, like flat out. If you were to go out and buy that report, obviously we negotiated, you know, a contract and blah blah blah. But that report's worth seventy five hundred dollars if you were to go out and buy that. That is just free ungated content that you're using as part of those campaigns. That's how I uh, we we've, we've had a lot of success doing it. And again, that's a luxury that we can kind of throw that stuff around a little bit. Uh, part of the Part of the reason we can do that is the data that drives a lot of the reports. Well, guess where that comes from? It's our data, right? So we've got that kind of connection. I know a lot of you put, uh, doing different things. Um, that's been very effective. And the other thing I'd like to add on that is um, I think very quickly, most people on this call hopefully have have peer companies that they know. Right? A good example of that would be um, us. We, we're very connected to all of the imagery companies because we literally couldn't be any more different, right? Like we've all got satellites. Yep. They're in orbits. Yep. They're expensive. Yep. They're cool. Yep. They've, they've got great names. Yep. The list goes on and on and on. Then you get to the payload part of it, you know, talking about payload and that's where we differ. So that gives us a really nice, friendly level playing field. And actually some of the EO friends might be on the, on this call, which I hope they are, but ride with them like if you are doing a posting on something and you, you know and again not not saying you have eo companies and, and and data companies but if you have other companies like that ride with them on that post say hey so and so at x company did this then you're instantly tacking tacking into their market their 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 followers their connections and that gives you a lot more credibility and i swear today that linkedin when you do that linkedin favors your posts i, I think it's algorithm shines upon you um and then you did ask about chat gbt um, wow is all I can say about ChatGPT. Um, you know, the, I, I keep, uh, surprising even myself. Like we do, we do use it as, as I think a lot of us probably do, you know, kind of like quick, quick turns here, maybe a little bit of content. You don't want to rewrite something, but sometimes you challenge it for something quite, you know, quite impressive. And the response has been great. And I hate to say this for my PR friends out there, but it can write a really good press release. Uh, it really can. So, uh, hopefully that's, uh, not a good sign. So yeah, but definitely we are using it. Um, uh, with moderation, with kind of sensible use. Uh, hopefully, a sensible use anyway. But yeah, Evan, on, on to you. Yeah, I think collaboration is key um, outwardly, but also kind of leveraging internal collaboration as well. I think we're very lucky to have, you know, five commercial business units within the company who also put out a lot of content. And I think the best part of that for us is reposting product updates that they put out. So even you know, contracts are great. And collaborations with other companies are fantastic, but also keeping your followers up to date on what is going on within your company itself and what the latest is with your products well is a great way to reach people um, as long as it's applicable, right? Yeah, and, and I wanted to just touch on um, the, the chat GPT comment of, um, you know, like we're using it at Payload, like I'm sure AI will be revolutionary, but I think um, what tends to happen and I want to give caution to everyone is like, when people go into AI, like it, it might sound great, but it doesn't become as, it takes a long time. We're a long time from it becoming impactful. There's like a hype cycle and then it's going to die down because it's expensive. Um, but I wanted to go on to a next question, which is relevant because how Ian and Evan and I met of like, 
how do you sell to sellers? Like when you go to these conferences and you're pitching the person who's at the booth, who's actually supposed to be selling, how do you facilitate that in such a way to get to the right person? I know we talked on a bit with intros, but specifically as it pertains to conferences, you know, if I'm going and, and trying to go sell and you, you know, it's not the right person, but you need to like go up and approach. How do you do that in a, in a good way? That's a great question. Um, and we, I think we all struggle with that, right? Like working the show is one of the most useful parts of being at a show, right? Like you have, if you're an exhibitor, you know, you've got a little bit early access. You can get there before it opens. You can get there before it, after it closes. You know, you can kind of wander around a little bit when maybe the attendees are off at, you know, at conferences and things, you know, off at like sessions. Um, but when you walk up to a booth, it's full of people selling it. And I think this gets harder as you get to the bigger companies. I think as you get to like the real powerhouse companies, a lot of the people in the booth will be, you know, will be sellers, like there's kind of, you know, what they're, uh, you know, what they're there to do and things like that. Um, and um, one thing I've discovered that, and again, this is this little tidbits here. Um, if check out the booth and if, if there's a desk or something like that, then there's a stack of business cards or like a business card holder, walk right over to that and you'll get grabbed by somebody. And, and then the question will be, yeah, what can I help you with? And you're like, which one of these people should I follow up with with my service? And again, um, you know, you'll get that kind of shame, like, I want to help you thing. And often you'll get, oh, yeah, um, you know what? You know, um, everyone's in charge of operations here. Um, follow him up. Follow up with him. Um, or B, you'll get, oh, that person's not here. Let me write it on the back of my card for you. And away you go. And that's a little bit what Ari was doing, right? Like, I think the first time I met Ari, he walked up and he's like, who does PR for you? And I'm like, who are you? You know, like things like this. And again, away we went. And, you know, I just gave him a name. And then next time I saw Ari at a show, uh, you had already talked to that person and then we could have a better conversation. So there's a little bit of a long game there. I think you got to, you know, may expect it to take more than one or two, but that business card trick never seems to fail. And I think it, even today, you still see a lot of that, uh, of those, those business cards being on the booth. People will, will take like someone else's role and leave it there. All that person was there just for one day and they've left, right? That would be frustrating too, if you're there the next day. Uh, so I, we've had some success with that. And then anything to add? Yeah. Um, I like to, take more of a direct approach a lot of the time. I think the only opportunity lost is an opportunity not pursued. So even if, you know, I walk up and I ask questions and, you know, give my pitch, get counter pitched, and we find out that there's, you know, there's no compatibility or op opportunity for collaboration there. I, you know, walk away having learned something about this sector that I'm very new to. So, um, you know, and maybe it's not a, never but maybe just not a right now kind of deal and then you start right there with building a relationship so i just think it's important to have the confidence to go up and ask the question initially and engage in the conversation because you'll learn something from it one way or another so so you know evan follow up um mm -hmm. in terms of you know the people building these relationships up both on bd and marketing you know when does it make sense for a company to have integrated for both commercial and federal versus you know i know a lot of companies especially in eo and like yourselves you know you have a, a separate unit i know you know planet has a separate unit stat logic well uh, um, mm -hmm. i'm sure i'm missing but many of the big eo companies they have separate federal units you know when does it make sense to separate those two versus having you know um, okay. the federal and commercial integrated I think just kind of into the sales cycle, um, you know, we as a federal team are very reliant in many ways on our commercial business units, right? Because we don't have necessarily our own, um, you know, dedicated engineers for each uh, data product and space services that we have. We collaborate with the rest of the company on the commercial side in order to, you know, see our sales process through to the end and get our customers what they need to be effective, whether that's on the military side and completing a mission um or you know system integrators looking to further their product um but yeah there's there's certain aspects of what we do that can't kind of be overlapped with the commercial business units and that's due to like itar restrictions and things like that due to the nature of some of our products so um i think collaboration as frequent as you can is fantastic but there's just some times that it can't happen ian anything to add nothing to add nailed it so, you know, I know we only have, you know, probably five, 10 more minutes left, um, you know, and again, as we wind down, if anyone has any last questions or chat, Q&A chats, whatever, um, but I have, I have one more big question to ask. Um, you know, I want to touch on earned media a bit. You know, we talked a lot about like, you know, paying for booths, paying for content, building your own content, but also the benefits of PR, whether that's, hey, 
you know, we have an article in payload or, Hey, we have a, we're speaking at a conference, yeah. you know, how should people think about those opportunities, help find those opportunities and why are they important opportunities to, to go and, and, and chase? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a certain amount of credibility with, with and media. Um, you know, if, if you're, if you, and it's, um, and I think I've always had kind of an interesting relationship with, with PR and press releases and things like that. Um, one thing that, um, I, we're pretty adamant on. I'm thinking this through before I answer here, but, um, if you get an award, if you've already got awards from the U.S. government, so that people, you know, the audience here today, if you've got an award with the U.S. government, it's public information, right? Check, check that it is. There's some agencies that, that don't disclose DARPA and NRO would be a good example, but most of them, you can go in spending.gov, put your company name in and you'll see, um, you know, how much revenue you got from the government last year. Um, you can go do that for Spire. I think it was 29.9 million uh, that will show up on that report. Um, Every time you, if you get an award, you can publicly say how much that award is. And if you put that into a, into a press release or you put that, you share that with, with that earned media kind of circle, you're likely to get a pickup if it's got, you know, a significant dollar amount on it. If you're part of an IDIQ that's got an upper limit of, you know, a hundred million or 50 million, talk, talk about that. Talk about that limit. You're allowed to do that. Uh, and I think that's a really good way of, of driving that trust, uh, in, in, you know, in that area. Um, we're also very transparent with, with the media that kind of follows, um, Spire around. Um, and in the past, I think we were a little bit kind of protective of IP and things like that. And, you know, over the last two or three years, we've really opened up the door and said, look, you know, come on in, you know, come, if you're in the, in the area, come to the, come to the facilities, um, you know, see, you know, come to the customer meetings, come to the investor briefings, come to the booths, you know, see the pitch. Like we're very, very friendly with that. And I think that that's paid off pretty well, uh, on that. So when I think about, you know, earned, um, and the media, I, th I think about that kind of relationship. Evan, anything to, to add to that? Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about things to add. I really don't think I could have said that better myself. So good on you, Ian. Thanks. Um, well, I don't know. Does Ian, Evan, any any last comments, questions? Anyone from the chat have any any last comments or questions? I think I got through everything I wanted to talk about, but yeah, um, cool. I don't know. Any Anything from you all? Well, while we're waiting there, you know, thanks for posting our LinkedIn posts. Um, you know, happy to connect to any, everybody here and hope to see you around at a show in the future. Um, you know, love, I love these kind of committees where we, we can all share information, what's working and not working. And th uh, thanks, Ari, for putting it together for us. Yeah. Evan, yeah. you got any, any last thoughts, comments? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks as well. Uh, I'm still very new to this space and I'm always looking to connect and talk to people who have, you know, varying levels of experience so I can learn something new. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, there's that last question that like, I think we just had. A oh, yeah. Someone just asked the last question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go, um, go at it. Is, do you, um, um, if you just, uh, a model, do you, if you, do you mind just reaching out on LinkedIn where we're find out what, where you're from, which service your academy you're in and we'll hook you up with somebody who transitioned and. You can we have a conversation one on one. Happy to do that. So yep, always happy to chat. If it's Navy, you've got Navy right here. But if if you're Air Force or Marine Corps or something else, let us know. So, but we've even got Merchant Marine, right? All right, Evan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a Merchant Marine. Yeah, um, and yeah, I think that's about it. Um, in terms of um, we're going to try to do these more. I'm trying to get these monthly. So if you guys like, if someone wants to do a webinar, someone wants to do an interview, write something. Let me know. I'm trying to restart my marketing newsletter for those of you who subscribe i will be the first to say i've not been as consistent as i want about it um but we'll try to do better and if you want to advertise with payload let me know i am i am all the ears would would love to would love to chat so um everyone have a great day and we'll see you on the next one